so they, they really start coming in <coughs> on uh, Monday. I say they practiced all these parade routes, and they actually listed what, what time the various nations are going to be leaving their, their hotels. N none of them left at the times they said, and none of them went by the routes they had said, but that was, that was purposeful. <coughs> but it was make, worked out so that George Bush, of course, would arrive first, and you'll see the red carpet, and he arrives, and George and Nancy Rupp and Charles Duncan say hello. The man to the left is the Ch Joe, Joseph Reed, who's chief of protocol. And so George and Barbara Bush get out, and Duncan and Rupp say hello, and they rush right into the Bush's office where they gave President Bush one of that three-volume book of the opening that celebrated the opening of rice. And that initial book was dedicated to Woodrow Wilson, so this one was dedicated to George Bush. And so George got here at 1246, and then at 1205, let's see, 105, the other nations start coming in seven-minute intervals beginning with the lowest, you know, shot the lower. Now, this is the way, it, see here, here again is Bush coming in, and you see Kent Anderson and Burt McMurtry and, and Evans Atwell, and the, the arm looks like a kind of an awkward arm for George Bush is James Baker, and that's John Cox down there. So the, the uh, heads of the delegation get out, and they shake hands with the members of the Rice Board. Now, here's the next person coming in. Now, behind this limousine, of course, there's an ambulance and secret service and support personnel and so forth. And every seven minutes, one comes up. And so they are met there, <coughs> but at this time, by George and uh, Barbara Bush. And they get out of the car, and Joseph Reed is there. And then the head of the delegation, you see the tape at the bottom of the, that's where they know where to stand. And then they come through Lovett Hall, and then they are gonna, they're going to turn left, and they're going to walk down the cloisters of Lovett Hall towards Sewell. Here is um, Maroney and his wife from Canada. And you see that they're, they're, they're walking down Lovett Hall, and they're just about to come out on that little ledge just east of Sewell. And they come down, and then they, they stand right, and that's a photo opportunity. And the piece of tape says, you know, Mr. Guest and Bush, and there's a Ms. Guest and Bush. So the heads of state walk out, and then they stop right where the tape is, and then the Joseph Reed, the uh, protocol, protocol person, steps aside. And this is picked because of sun and shade and everything. And there's a, <laughs> you know, a thousand cameras take pictures. And then President Bush and Mrs. Bush walk back down toward the Sally Port because the next person is getting there in about two minutes. And then they hand over uh, the guest to Joseph Reed, the protocol guy, who says hello. And then he hands him over to Fred Malik. And then Fred Malik takes them over to a uh, faculty club, where they will each waiting as they're coming in seven-minute intervals. And the spouses and the lower-level people, like finance ministers and foreign ministers, they kind of cool their heels in the Sewell Art Gallery. And a special exhibit was put up there for them. And so slowly, one by one, they all get in. Here's his helmet Cole. His wife didn't come. And so he'll stand there just for a second, and they'll chat. And they Photograph, photograph, and they face the cameras. Pictures are taken, and that guy with the handkerchief in his uh, in his uh, shelf in his pocket there, that's Joseph Reed, and that's Fred Malik. And then they'll say, "Here you go." And then these guys take him over to the faculty club, and Mr. Ms. Bush go back down to the Sally Port to get the next person. And then at 2:05, uh, shortly before 2:05, there's going to be a huge parade of all kinds of color guards and that kind of stuff. And at 2.05, the de delegation is going to go out the far end, the east end of the uh, faculty club, and they're going to walk around to the front of the, of the Levitt Hall, and then they're going to come in through the sally port, <coughs> and they're going to get lined up, and then they're going to walk down this red carpet to this outdoor air-conditioned little uh, stand. Meanwhile, the, 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 all this music is going on to entertain people. They have the flags of all the countries. And actually, it was quite difficult to get the right size flags and so forth. And to, make, and to know which way a flag is supposed to go. I mean, you might just think a flag is just a flag, but they're up and down sides of flags. And unless you know, you can't tell. Like the Texas flag, you know, it's a, the red and the white have to be a certain way. So we had to get the right size flags and flying them right. That is a Canadian flag. And so Lovett Hall looked quite festive with all these flags. And then the bands, of course, would play the music of the, each nation as they came in to make it seem, you know, really homey and so forth. And so you see the Japanese flag and British flag and so forth. <coughs> and they had these 75 millimeter 
towed howitzers on World War II, 105 howitzer carriages that had been flown in on the C-140, and they're going to shoot dummy, you know, uh, uh, bullets when everybody gets here to, uh, to signal the beginning. I know my, little, my son was really young then. He was quite disturbed. These were pointing over toward the Herman Hospital, but they were not firing real shots. Meanwhile, see the, the, the color guards out here in the sun marching around. Of course, they had to cut down about 80 feet of the hedge there because they had to make a marching ground. So even now, you notice if you look really carefully, part of the hedge between the Willie Statue and Lovett Hall is not quite as tall as the rest. It was completely cut down and uh, sprayed for ants and so forth so that this uh, color guard could march back and forth in front, see there, between the statue and uh, that little reviewing stand. <coughs> And uh, there, it's a, quite interesting. I always thought it was kind of funny how here's Margaret Thatcher and here's the American Revolutionary Soldiers, you know. <laughs> I, I thought maybe that wasn't the best of taste, you know. But anyway, uh, now you see the heads of state, they're there, and they watch about the final three or four minutes of the fife and drum deal. And then uh, George Bush get, reads his two-minute talk. And Andriotti there, is, I guess, is reading uh, either the itinerary or reading the uh, message translated and so forth. And then they quickly, by now it's almost 3 o'clock, they quickly go back into the founder's room, and that's that, uh, that second largest table in the founder's room. <coughs> there are a few minutes of photographers around, and then they meet for about an hour and a half. And while they're meeting for an hour and a half, the finance ministers and the foreign ministers are meeting in those special tables in the library. They don't meet there again, but they've got all that's been done for that Monday afternoon. And then... By this time, it's about 5 o'clock. They quit a few minutes early because some of them were tired having gotten there that morning from the World Cup. And they have to go out for what they call the class photo. And this is picked because the sun is just right. It's not too bright, not shadows and so forth. So they go all the way back out under. Now, while they're meeting in, their, uh, in the founder's room, they are <coughs> very quickly vacuuming the uh, red carpet. And uh, they're putting down the uh, masking tape so it tells each person where they're supposed to stay. Now, one of the controversies was, is this exactly the right red? And there was some dispute. Was it, the, was it too dark, too light, whatever, you know? And uh, it was too narrow. All eight heads of state delegation couldn't walk on that red carpet, but they couldn't walk single file. But it looks silly to have a red carpet, you know, 40 feet wide. But in fact, even that sidewalk is not wide enough for all of them to walk abreast. Well, poor old Jacques Delore, the guy from the economic community, who's the lowest guy, on the, on the, you know, he's the guy who has to walk on the grass. Then they come down from their, uh, uh, from their meeting room, and they have to all line up because those they can mark. You see here, they're all kind of making sure that they get in their right step, and they're following the tape, and there's somebody there saying, you know, okay, you know, Maroney, get over here, you know, Cole, get over here. They all get lined up, <coughs> and then they walk out. Here they go, get ready to walk out, and uh, you see, you can see the poor old Jacques Delore. The sidewalk's not wide enough for him, and they're going to walk out, and there they stand, and they have the Kleist photo. Now, the real Kleist photo, they airbrushed out that, uh, those tapes. So when you see the official photo, you don't see the tape to tell them where to stand. And then, they, after that, they, they go back into their momentary offices, and they're in, prior, in rank order, they're taken to their hotels. And while, that evening, then they t take up the carpet, and they take up the uh, reviewing stand. Here is the big meeting table, the $175,000 table. It really was a beautiful table. Curly maple, cut in 1962. Now this, this is where they're going to exit on Tuesday to go have lunch in the faculty club. This is that far door of, you know, out toward Weiss College near the loading dock that's been covered up and the flags of the various nations. And then they're going to come out, and, they, and the bus is now get, getting out of the way, and they're walking down the smooth, no bump, no signs, black, new blacktop. Now, somebody got messed up because they're out of protocol order. So I don't know, probably somebody got in trouble for that, but <coughs> they come down to uh, the faculty club, where they've taken all the chairs out of the faculty club, and they put in all new furniture, and they put in, brought in some beautiful tables and so forth from uh, Bio Ben, and they have a wonderful dinner that's catered by Jackson Hicks. And they get in there, and they, it's interesting, uh, uh, President Bush introduces Rick Guido to Margaret Thatcher, and he says, tell Mrs. Thatcher about some of the courses offered at Rice. And so Rick says, you know, engineering and so forth. And she says, in architecture, 
You know, I, I assume she had been uh, keyed because Sir James Sterling from England had just built the architectural building, so she must have found out an Englishman built Zion this building. Then they go on down a little bit later, uh, uh, Bush calls Guido over and said, tell them about the, how big the rice endowment is, and he tells them. And then they discover that they had somehow forgotten to have paper. And he asked Mr. Guido, will he go back into his office and bring out some uh, faculty club uh, letterhead, you know. And so Mr. Guido walks back and opens his office, and the gun's pulled, secret service are in there, you know. <laughs> you know hey, hey, I'm just getting paper, you know, President Bush. Uh, but Mr. Guido had three little interesting episodes there. Uh, here they are at this special table and special food, and that's not, that's not the way the fact club, as you know, normally looks. Now, <coughs> that evening, they had dinner at Bao Ben, and they brought in special, special pictures and so forth of Bao Ben, although there are already a lot of paintings there. And they had another photo op out in the yard there. And then you see the Margaret Thatcher and so forth. And they have a very nice dinner. And the foreign ministers and the, head and the uh, finance ministers are eating at other places on camp on, in town. One at Tony's and one at the U of H Wortham House. And then the next morning, they all come back to the uh, big table there in the business school, the Herring Hall, and they meet. And uh, here they are. This is the final day. There's a photographers are in taking pictures and so forth. Uh, Tuesday night, their dinner is at uh, the Museum of Fine Art. And the, and the U.S. Treasury Department loaned them a Trumbull painting of Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury, to hang there behind President Bush since it was an economic summit. And then there was sort of an entertainment there in that Brown Theater. And that's it. They have a meet about an hour and a half Wednesday morning. And then they run down to the Brown Convention Center, and they say, we've had a great conference. We're going to meet next year in England. And uh, that's it. And by noon of Wednesday, this is the remains out behind, over back where they're building the new Martell, of what had been the reviewing stand with the air conditioning ducts and so forth. They've already, and they've already been in to put their shrubs back. And, and by the next morning, they're ripping out the, uh, the sort of covering of... Uh, of uh, Weiss, and they start moving all the walls and so forth in the library. <coughs> all those walls have been installed with some kind of a pressure device, so they just have to have holes and screws and nails into the existing walls. So they're taking down all the, sh all the fake doors and all the, they move, they send back to whoever loaned them all the furniture and all the paintings and all the drapes and so forth, and they put everything back the way it was. And if you were here, it was just kind of amazing. In like two or three days, they're just ripping stuff up. And one of the most amazing things to me was all these heads of state and all their, their, their staff members and their secret service, when they left, they vandalized. I mean, they had all, all these uh, offices in the library, for example, what is, uh, at that time it was the, uh, computer, the computer institute, and they had little offices that would say, you know, finance minister of England, finance minister of France, and so forth. And they had little plaques and stuff identifying it all. And when they left, the secret service and the various personnel ripped the stuff off the wall and took it home. So, uh, you know, I guess vandalism is a worldwide, you know, no matter how educated or how rich or whatever, you know, and they left. All there are people at Rice, I think, too, isn't that true? <laughs> Who somehow ended up with uh, interesting artifacts from this event. But anyway, everybody who was involved, you may remember the kind of silly, silly stuff and the extravagance and the expense and the disruption and the fact that the campus was sort of totally, you know, uh, private, secret, uh, territory for three or four days. But people all over the world saw the heads of state, you know, walking under Lovett Hall and saw those arches and, and saw those flags and heard the music. And, you know, it was really a, it was a proud moment to be at Rice. And, I mean, it's true that basically they decided nothing. I mean, the European countries said, we ought to give more aid to Russia. Gorbachev's having a tough time. And Bush says, no, you can give money if you want to, we're not. And then the European countries said, we ought to do something about, uh, 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 global warming and so forth. And Bush says, we're not sure that's happening. We're not going to do it. You can be, do it if you want to. And the United States wanted to, wanted to uh, lift a lot of the agricultural uh, uh, tariffs on various nations. And the European nations said, no, having farmers is so important to our culture. Even if it costs us money, we want to keep farmers. So we're not, we're not going to drop the uh, agricultural tariffs. And so basically, they decided nothing. And what little was decided was decided by lower-level people called Sherpas. Remember, in, uh, in, in the Himalayas, if you climb Mount Everest, 
you know, there's a, a you have a little uh, native person there who can breathe, you know, at 23,000 feet or whatever, who carries all your luggage and cooking stuff, and they're called Sherpas. So the people who do the heavy lifting at climbing high summits are Sherpas. So the people doing all the grunt work, work staying up all night, writing the economic documents and so forth, are called Sherpas. And so the Sherpas worked months and months and months in advance of this meeting. And whatever happened, the Sherpas had already done. And the heads of state kind of meet and talk and chat and sign some document and go home. And the Sherpas and the finance minister continue working. So really, in some ways, the whole thing is sort of a show. It's sort of a facade. And literally, uh, it's a photographic opportunity that broadcasts to the world heads of state being friendly and acting knowledgeable and pretending to make important decisions and everything is choreographed down to where you stand and what you say and what you sign. Still, for people at Rice, we like to think of this picture of that date in July 1990 when the heads of delegation from the Western industrialized countries spent a few days on our campus. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> Any people who were here have comments or questions? Okay. My sense is that this level of economic summit, where you've got eight people meeting like that, that it really is a kind of a public relations kind of thing. They wanted to show so, sort of solidarity. And at the very end, one of the... Uh, a British said, guy said, you know, this is 1990 and the Soviet Empire has just fallen. And now that we're at the show point, it's so important that we sort of have this show of solidarity and working and talking together. But I don't think anything of substance comes out of this level of meeting. Now, it may be at some meetings that they can agree on something, and, but those, even those agreements are worked out in advance so that when they actually get there, you know, all the real thought and labor and so forth has been done in advance. But <clears throat> People told me that, you know, if you think this is choreographed, you'll choose the one in Williamsburg when President Reagan was there. Because President Reagan was famously choreographed. He said, you know, he had people buy a car and they would say, you know, turn right and say hello. And, so, so this, you know. and that, he, people even showed me some of the choreographed kind of stuff of some of the previous summits. And it was a degree of kind of, of uh, direction. That it seems to me to be the meaning if you were smart enough to be in that office for somebody to tell you turn right, turn left, walk three steps, say hello, you know. Uh, but I guess, you know, you don't have to know where I make a mistake because everything is mistake proof. Okay, Ann? With all the security, was there ever any, I don't remember anything, any... No, absolutely nothing untoward happened. And all the electronic uh, security was destroyed. I mean, the They destroyed a lot of uh, surveillance information. Uh, but if something had happened, they would have had it. But that was the agreement that it would be short term, that it would have to be destroyed unless it was needed. And it wasn't needed, so it was all destroyed. We, we moved out of Lovett Hall for about three weeks. Why? Right, into Brown College? Well, some did, but <coughs> some of us moved into, the, into Allen Center. And one of the most humorous things, I think, of the whole visit was that when they walked, after they came on the bus, they got out of the bus and they were going to walk up to, to the faculty club, everybody in the building went to the windows. Uh, I thought the building was going to tip over <laughs> because everybody was pressed up against the windows on all three floors watching this parade go by. And we all waved to each other as they passed. I mean, even security, even they go there, you know, they stopped and searched under your car and all kinds yeah. of stuff. You had security mm -hmm. clearance and, you know, that when people cleaned the buildings and the key places, they had security people along with the janitor. I mean, it was unbelievably secure place for two or three days. And even for the food in the faculty club, it was all tested and all that. You know, there was absolutely no way anyone could be poisoned or anything else. It was... With all that activity, a lot of things just went on as normal. Yeah, that's the sure right thing. That was, Ross made that very clear that a lot of the labs, the labs in particular, where you have ongoing uh, experiments and animals and so forth, you, that has to be able to go. So 
that secured, secured parameters, they was, you know, left the science building straight. Not the physics building, but I mean, the, and so, yeah, it is. And actually, even in the, even the people who lose, like the library, it was one of the buildings that really used, we actually were able to use the library until Friday, like at 5 10 o'clock. And then we, we weren't able to go in there. But uh, when Thursday morning, the library was open again. I mean, it took a while to get all the kind of fake walls removed and so forth. But uh, yeah, it was amazing what all they did, how they, how the basic academic life. Now they also realized that they said, well, the campus looks too austere. There are no students around, in the heart of the campus. Well, <laughs> there was a reason there were no students, but they thought that the academic wardrobe will look <coughs> empty. So they they bought 206 24-inch terracotta pots, remember those big pots, they're called sunny pots, and they got 5,700 periwinkles and planted in these 206 huge terracotta pots and put all around the academic quadrangle under all the arches to give a little life and color since there were no students there. And then they, they planted 33,000 red begonia at the front of the campus. And they gave out flower pots of red begonia to people in houses all around the city, all around this area of the city. So that for three or four days, it would look very floral and festive and so forth. And they had all kinds of community cleanups along, you know, parade routes and so forth to pick up trash and so forth. I mean, the whole, and, the, and there was all kinds of inconvenience for traffic and so forth. And the city put up with it amazingly well. It was just like, I think people sort of felt like Houston got a lot of bad press. In the Senate, we've been quite arrogant about all those people in Michigan that are all leaving, turn out the light, the last guy to leave Michigan and so forth. And, and then, you know, of course, we had the oil bust in the 80s. And so Houston, I think, was feeling kind of bad and kind of wanted to sort of say, hey, we're not such bad guys. And so let's kind of discover a new face. And so people were willing, people did amazing things. They even got this great little motto that says, Houston's hot. <laughs> now, so they wanted to make, they wanted to turn it into a plus. The fact that, and it actually, Despite all the whining of the Northeast journalist, it was actually hotter in Washington, D.C. those three days than it was in Houston. Of course, you never saw that. It was just, you know, insufferable 92 degrees in Houston. But it was equally humid and hotter in Washington. One, one thing they did not do is they did not change the locks in Lubbock Hall. I was in it. My office was Helmut Cole's office. Yeah. I was in Helmut Cole's office minutes after he left. But you couldn't have gotten in there with even the ring. No, but they yeah. didn't change the locks. I yeah. have, I have. <coughs> it is amazing that they take the they front trout, the drapes, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the, uh, there was a printout of all the different knickknacks. I mean, again, all these offices, they brought in knickknacks and photographs and potted plants and everything. And they just overnight became really handsome, sort of what diplomatic quality offices. And then it was all gone uh, two days later. Thousands of items were moved in and out in these offices. Kind of stunning. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.